Hey all, Josh's severe weather here, and we're going to talk about what could be a very extreme damaging weather year here in the United States in the year 2023. I hope you all had a great 2022. I think if you're like me, you're kind of happy for a new year to begin uh, and very unpredictable year to say the least, not just from the weather standpoint, but if you had told me at the beginning of the year what would have happened this year, I would not believe you. But anyway, I believe I've been called to do my best to give you guys as accurate a forecast as demands in the world of meteorology. So I'm gonna share my screen with you and talk about what's gonna be some very um, interesting weather to say the least here in the new year. Um, I do believe that as we head into the spring, um, we may be looking at potentially our most active tornado season in maybe 10 years with the threat for maybe our first EF5 tornado since the year 2013, as well as the potential for flooding in parts of the South and middle part of the country. Um, and after we get through the first couple of weeks of heavy rain here in California, we could see kind of a, a resurgence in maybe some drought weather here over the first half of the year before that could change later on in the year. So nonetheless, I do believe that we've got some flux in the atmosphere. We've got some changes coming to the global weather picture here that can lead to a very um, extreme weather year in the year 2023. Now, of course, uh, the level of certainty here is not super high. Uh, I can't tell you what's going to happen on what day of the year in your backyard. All I can really do is do my best to predict uh, what I believe is going to be uh, a pretty crazy year. So I'm actually going to put together a PowerPoint for you guys here, and um, we will take a look here at the next uh, year and what's expected to occur. And um, basically, the La Nina that we've been in here in the United or in the world uh, since the summer of 2020 is predicted to come to an end and fade here into the sunset by spring. Um, this is from the ECMWF. It's the European Center for Meteorological Weather Forecasting. And um, it is showing um, a pretty strong chance that the La Nina we've been in is going to eventually head towards a more neutral um, anomaly here in the uh, South Pacific and possibly even an El Nino beginning in the fall and into the winter time. And anytime you've got so much flux in the weather globally, um, we certainly could have um, some extreme weather events. And I'm gonna get into the methodology as to why I believe that's gonna occur and what studies have shown. Um, there is certainly a possibility that El Nino could take over here as soon as summertime, which would be great for those of us in the Atlantic Basin. Typically, um, an El Nino means stronger wind shear and fewer strong storms, which doesn't always mean that, but that's a guideline to follow. Uh, but there's also a chance that we could be kind of in purgatory here where we're sitting in a, what's called a lanata or, or a neutral enso el, el nino southern oscillation and that could certainly still keep things pretty active so a little bit too soon to give you an exact tropical forecast i think in a couple of months i'm going to have a better handle on that and we'll be able to give you a more accurate forecast uh, as a uh, tropical season six months away now halfway across the year um, so let's look at what the last 12 years have looked like. The reds are El Ninos and the blues are La Ninas. And of course, the gray is more neutral La Nada. And you can see when that uh, La, La Nina took over here, this is uh, J June, July, and August. And that started in the year 2020. So basically a few months in the pandemic, uh, we went from uh, a La Nada into a La Nina. And that led to a very active hurricane season, in fact, a record-breaking Atlantic hurricane season in 2020. That happened in a transition uh, from basically neutral to a La Nina. So La Nina wasn't really fully in place until the second half of that season. Uh, but because we had that transition, we had um, a very busy season. And when you have big changes like that, that throw the atmosphere into a big giant curveball, then that's when you see these extreme events. Last year, of course, we were still in a La Nina. It wasn't a strong one at that point. In fact, our strongest was in the fall of 2020. Um, then we, that's why we had so many storms the second half of the 2020 hurricane season. Last year was still active, but not as active as 2020, of course. And then we still had, of course, Hurricane Ida. And then 2022, um, we continue to be in a La Nina, but I'm gonna show you some changes that I believe will be occurring and where they're coming from. Um, it was an active hurricane season, but not as active as 2021 or certainly 2020. Um, and all it takes is one storm, as you guys saw in South Florida with Hurricane Ian. We have four key El Nino regions. This is going to be important. I'll show you what this, what this comes to. The Nino 3.4 is half of Nino 3 and half of Nino 4. This is the international dateline. So Nino 4 is a Central Pacific 
three is the eastern and one and two is a very small area off of the Ecuador and Peru coastline of the far eastern Pacific. Uh, I'm going to show you where these come into play um, in our forecast. So as we go on to the uh, next slide, I will show you all that um, we continue to be in that La Nina. Um, this is tropicaltidbits.com. As of today, you can still see the blue colors showing below average sea surface temperatures across the central and eastern Pacific. And the index is close to minus one. Um, so minus 0.5 to minus one degree Celsius below the average shows that we're in kind of a weak to moderate La Nina. But as that number gets closer to zero and above 0.5 degrees Celsius below, so an ONI of 0.5 or lower uh, to an ONI of plus 0.5, then we have a neutral La Nada. And then as the ONI goes above 0.5 positive, which means water temperatures in this area would flip to red, we'd have above average sea surface temperatures, then we'd be in an El Nino. And that is what a lot of models are showing may be occurring as we head into this upcoming fall, so about nine or 10 months from now. And of course, that's quite a bit of time off, so that forecast could certainly change. Uh, but certainly that's what I'll be watching for you all. Now, what I will show you, this is from the latest NOAA report that the transitioning out of the La Nina is already starting to begin in the far eastern Pacific, uh, as well as uh, western parts of the central Pacific, but especially right over here, we can see in the last four weeks, um, sea surface temperatures have trended upward so that they are two degrees, they've, they've basically gained two degrees of anomaly uh, Celsius, so about almost four degrees Fahrenheit. So we're seeing the beginning signs of what will be a transition out of La Nina coming in region one and two over here uh, near the uh, Ecuador, Peruvian, um, Ecuador and Peru coastline. Um, we're not seeing that kind of change across the majority of Nino regions three and four though. Um, so it's starting in one and two right now. And that's something that we're going to keep an eye on here and why the models are starting to pick up on this big change coming. By the way, the Gulf of Mexico remains above average. And with the mild weather we're having now, that will likely continue to be something we'll have to factor in the next hurricane season. Um, whereas the tropical Atlantic remains a little below average. This is from the cold wave we just have uh, just had here about a week ago, right before Christmas. Um, but the tropics remain at or above average. And that may be more in line with what's an active decadal. Uh, oscillation or a decade index where we've had an active decade of tropical weather and more of a global um, global pattern as well. So uh, trans Nino, I know it sounds kind of funny, but um, there is a term called the trans Nino index, and that measures that difference uh, between those Nino regions one and two, that was the far eastern Pacific right off of the South American coast, and Nino region four, which is the central Pacific, three of course is in between the two. And the larger that difference, so the more warming we see in the far eastern Pacific with respect to what's going on in the central Pacific, um, the more likely we are going to have a high TNI index and studies have shown that those have led to the most significant tornado outbreaks that we've seen in the US in history. Uh, more than 70% of those positive TNI events are ones when busy, uh, busy tornado seasons are occurring and we believe that there'll be Obviously, that occurring again, based on what I just showed you guys, this transition out of La Nina into a more neutral. Uh, and I'll show you why that is. Um, I'll actually show you guys the study here before we go back to my PowerPoint. And um, this is was presented to NOAA, um, a, a study by Song Ki Lee, um, or Sang Ki Lee, um, showing that um, during 20, 2004 to 2013, um, the most active year, as you guys probably know, uh, I'm in Raleigh, and of course that was a big year for us here in Raleigh, was 2011. And uh, the tornado-related death, death toll only trailed behind heat-related statistics. Uh, as we head into looking at those most positive Trans Nino years, um, the number of intense EF3 to EF5 tornadoes was nearly twice what it was during a transition year than it was during either a La Nina or an El Nino. Since we are in a trans Nino year, it looks like as we're coming out of La Nina and going potentially into El Nino, the chance of, of strong tornadoes this year is gonna be twice what it was last year. And we could see an end to our drought of not having an EF5 tornado since the year 2013. Uh, that is not the news I wanna share with you all if this does come to fruition, of course. Um, even in a neutral trans Nino year, um, which doesn't look like we're into, um, you can still see that a lot of strong tornadoes have occurred. But as we go into a more positive, the threat for those stronger tornadoes has extended farther north and east. 
into the Tennessee Valley, into the Ohio Valley. So um, typically speaking, the deep south is going to see the biggest chance for tornadoes over the next couple of months. We're going to see that here in just a couple of days. As we get into March, though, the plains get more active, especially Texas and Oklahoma, but also all the way up in Nebraska. And then as we get into April and May, um, really this entire region sees a maximum amount of uh, tornado outbreak. And then heading into June, um, in a positive transunion year in June, um, the Great Lakes region and the upper Midwest stand a much higher chance than what you would normally have of a stronger tornado occurring. So those of you that are watching me here from the upper Midwest, keep that in mind that uh, it could be a very active start to the summer. And uh, these trans Nino years typically uh, go on during the spring following the peak of a La Nina. We've peaked in the La Nina last year. We're coming up on spring here uh, when we certainly have that risk for uh, enhanced tornado activity. Um, with the five historic years of 1917, 1925, 36, 74, and of course 2011, the one that I remember, um, was, was a trans Nino year. So we're seeing that setup that occurred in 2011. Uh, also going to likely be in, in place here for 2023. And I'm not going to show you guys all the science behind it. You're welcome to search for it. Um, wasn't my study, of course. I just study this as a meteorologist. Uh, but there's certainly some interesting data that shows how these um, transitions occur and uh, where we're likely to see um, the most active tornadoes. So um, a lot of very good information here that I've used to study because I found that you look at models all day long, but it doesn't show you the big picture. Um, one other thing I do want to show you guys, um, back to the PowerPoint here, and um, from the current slide here, um, we also know that there are recurring weather cycles. These are nothing new. There are some scientists that have studied that. Um, one of the cycles I'm looking at, um, since we just came through a historical um, Arctic outbreak here back uh, right around Christmas time, um, that was very similar to similar outbreaks in 1983 and 1989, right around the same time of year. In fact, many of the record lows on Christmas Eve that we broke were either set in 1983 or 1989. Now, the following springs, we saw those outbreaks of tornadoes. So there's kind of a cycle that goes on. You wait about three months and tornado season starting off very active in 1984 and especially 1990. Also, flooding was a problem, especially in 1990. So while La Nina, El Nino can override those teleconnections, um, seeing something such as a, a trough in the west, which I showed you on the initial graphic, and a ridge in the east can lead to multi-day tornado outbreaks. And um, that negative PNA during a trans Nino event could lead to very destructive weather. So this is not gonna happen every day of the spring, but when we see the PNA going negative, showing a trough in the west, and then picking up moisture from the Gulf, a big ridge taking place over the Great Lakes and east, then in between the two, we will likely have tornado outbreaks that could go more than a day. So that's something I'm going to be watching for for you guys. Um, looking at the climate models, we look at the European seasonal. I say spring and February uh, because that's when um, her, uh, tropical or tornado season starts getting really cranking here in the deep south. You can see that here is that negative PNA where we've got the trough in the west. These are the below average heights and the ridge in the east. And um, the more um, more yellow going farther north, meaning the stronger the ridge in the east, the more likely we'll see bad weather across the plains and with the warm Gulf of Mexico flooding as well across parts of the mid and deep south as well. And the seasonal forecast from last month shows that a wetter than average spring is expected um, focused on the Ohio River Valley in Kentucky, but spreading down into Texas, whereas uh, it'll stay warm and drier than average in the far southeast and drier than average across the southwest once we get past this little episode of the atmospheric river i've talked about um, whereas the northwest will turn wetter and it's going to be chilly here across the interior northwest so we could have a lot of snow in the, in the coming months less snow as we get into denver and the plains and unfortunately this area could use a lot more rain it looks like most of the heavy rain is going to spread east of you and stay east of you in kansas and nebraska um, we'll have to wait for an El Nino to take over. So those of you in this area that really need the rain may have to wait to see significant wet periods uh, to the second half of 2022 and especially next winter. So that's what I'm watching for you guys. I really appreciate your time here. Um, actually, I'm going to share my screen one more time and just show you that graphic once again. And let me get a get out of PowerPoint here. Um, I did mention hurricane season. And that's a question I get asked every year. We're going to have a bad hurricane season. Well, typically heading into an El Nino, we see more wind shear and less active 
hurricane seasons. Wind shear tears up storms, keeps them from becoming strong. However, we do have warm water in the tropics. I did show you that. And the warm spring here in the southeast could certainly uh, magnify uh, water temperatures this summer and fall and could continue to bring concerns for rapidly intensifying storms, provided the wind shear is not strong. It's too soon right now to say if that wind shear is going to be strong enough to deter major hurricanes. If we do stay kind of in a neutral zone, the La Nada, it could be another active season. And really, it only takes one storm, even in an El Nino year. So um, we may have to wait another year before we see a less active hurricane season. I do think 2023 has the potential to be destructive, but it's obviously way too soon to make any kind of educated guess on that. And uh, also major consequences for next winter. Generally, El, El Nino brings us cooler, wetter weather in the south. So after the dry, hot summer we had, we could be heading in the other direction with flooding, severe weather more likely next winter. Also drier weather in the pack northwest. And then Southern Cal, you're getting a preview, especially Central Cal, uh, of uh, El Nino right now with the storms bombarding the southwestern United States. But depending on the flavor of El Nino, we could see a much more significant amount of rain, flooding, and landslides uh, occurring next winter in Southern California. So too much of a good thing could be really bad. Those effects are felt the strongest in the winter after the onset of, of, of the El Nino event. So if we go into El Nino later this summer or fall, we're likely to have potentially some, some destructive weather over the upcoming winter. This winter is going to stay mild, but we will have cold outbreaks. I'm not going to rule out a storm here in the Southeast. Certainly that's possible, but the Average snowfall is probably going to stay below average here across much of the south and in the Midwest and especially around the Great Lakes above average in the Northeast. We just have to get the ingredients to line up and I'll keep you guys posted on when that will happen with my upcoming videos. So I hope everybody's got has a really wonderful um, 2023. Uh, if there's anything that I've learned, it's to not take anything for granted, any day for granted, not to count down the days because every day matters. And the reason that I believe that is I'm a believer in Christ and Romans 8.28 tells me that we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And I'm called to not only help save lives through weather forecasting, but to help save souls. And if you are a believer, um, please, uh, I hope you keep this verse in mind for next year as you go on through your daily struggles and daily temptations, knowing that loving God will again cause all good things to occur. If you're not a believer, I'm happy to talk to you more about that. And if you have any prayer requests, I'm happy to provide those to you and pray for you and have others pray for you as well. Thank you guys so much for joining me. We'll give you guys new content in the new year. Like and subscribe and please follow along with more updates on Facebook. Thank you all. Hope you have a wonderful 2023 and please God bless you.